Um, I'm Maggie Byrne. I'm Chair of Social Change Initiative and um, we're having a discussion today about the um, role of media in Northern Ireland and how it addresses or doesn't address division and how it reflects diversity. Um, we had a really interesting conference organised by SCI some time ago, looked at this, this issue internationally and the three speakers we have today, three contributors we have today, we're all at that conference, um, so I'm looking forward to a really interesting exchange now um, between us all and what's the learning, but particularly yeah, to drill down about the experience in Northern Ireland and what we have to learn either from elsewhere or what we have to offer elsewhere. So the three people that will be uh, talking to us today are Ivy Goddard, who is the project director of the Inter-Ethnic Forum, so Mid and East Antrim, um, obviously particular concern about uh, the representation of ethnic minorities uh, in the media uh, and how they're portrayed. Um, we have Amanda Ferguson, who's here, who's a journalist, who works from North Belfast, um, has written extensively about uh, the situation in Northern Ireland and is particularly interested in the question about women in the media. And Denzel McDaniel, who is from, uh, was previously the editor of, of The Impartial Reporter and um, has Got a particular interest in the legacy of the troubles and how that is reflected in our media and what our media can do about um, developing you know some responses to that and you know ending some of the the conflict and division or at least trying to not stir it up any further um so maybe if i can kick off if um denzel do you want to come in and give us some opening remarks about uh the legacy and then i'll move on to each of the speakers in turn, each of the contributors in turn, and then um, we have about 30 minutes in total. So um, after each of us made a, a short contribution, then we'll open it up for an exchange between the four of us. So thank you very much, Denzel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, on the subject of, of, of legacy, um, a couple of months ago, the violent protests in Washington uh, saw some Trump supporters carry a Confederate flag. Uh, a divisive racist symbol, which is a throwback to the American Civil War. And it's a flag remarkably still being carried more than 150 years later. In an article I read about the atmosphere in the American South at that time in 1865 recalled this. After the guns fell silent, another form of battle raged over whose version of the conflict would prevail. And it sort of struck a chord with me because I think in a sense, we are experiencing that here. Um, and that's the background into which the media covers the legacy of our recent past, where the battle over memory and memorial is often fought out in the media. And that legacy and how we deal with it is proving an almost intractable problem for society. So if society is having trouble with its past, a media that is part of that society is struggling with it too. Um, I think we also narrow the definition of legacy down as well as if the world only started in 1970. Um, but I would argue that to fully grasp the complexity of legacy, we need to consider greater context. Indeed, what Irish writer Hubert Butler called the sores of history. And if I might digress just for a moment, um, I recall reading an article by David Rieff, who reported on the Bosnian conflict. In 1993, he visited a camp in Belgrade of a leader fighting Milosevic. And as the journalist was leaving, a young aide pressed a piece of paper into his hand and it was blank except for a date, 1453, the year that Orthodox Constantinople fell to Muslim Ottomans. So a participant in a 20th century conflict was inspired by an event more than 500 years previously. And this is not uncommon across the world, including here, where succeeding generations carry the burden of their antecedents. I was engaged in a discussion recently about the partition of Ireland a century ago, and Johnson McMaster's book on the subject recalls that many in the sizable Protestant community in East Donegal still carry a resentment about being abandoned by their fellow Ulster Unionists 100 years ago, and he described this as intergenerational anger. And to come up to date, last November I wrote a piece about the, the Taoiseach Michal Martin coming to Enniskillen were among the people gathering for Remembrance Sunday were grandchildren of those killed in the 1987 bombing, adults now not even born at the time. So if we say our past is our present, it is often also our future. 
Um, by its nature, a lot of our media is about the here and now. Um, resources are often limited, and air time and space often mean that stories about anniversaries and uh, are often simplified. And indeed, media commentators now take up positions more than ever, which fall into whichever particular narrative they support. And social media now adds to a public discourse, which further creates division. It can often mean that all voices of victims and bereaved are not heard. It can be relatively easy for journalists to go to the same sources. And the possibility is that only those voices are heard. Yet not all victims or indeed victims organizations think alike. I do absolutely agree that victims should be front and center of our legacy discussion, but I do wonder as well if some of the people who say that are virtue signaling, particularly when we see the way the pension issue has been handled and the failure of various legacy initiatives. So we get coverage which is about more than remembering, it's about insisting on not forgetting, about blame, about holding out for justice which may or may not be attainable and even on occasions perhaps about seeking to avenge, all of which may be considered legitimate. But I think that literature, the arts, and the many discussion groups that go on away from the public gaze are often better suited to the atmosphere needed for people to tell their stories and for the difficult conversations that need to heal the hurt of the past, often unacknowledged hurts. A book, for example, by Miroslav Wolf called The End of Memory examines how we should remember atrocities. But the media has a role to play too, and some do it very well. Um, for example, just one example, I think Brian Rowan, particularly on the Eamon Malley website, is very informative about legacy. And uh, Trevor Burney's film No Stone Unturned, by investigating collusion in the Lock and Island murders, spoke truth to power and challenged a long-held tendency for our media of holding the establishment line. It's significant, I think, that this film is yet to be shown by the BBC and the corporation's dominant position in the media here highlights a lack of plurality in our media. Some BBC output, uh, which examines legacy is really, really good, but others can be superficial and unnecessarily controversial in discussing issues born out of trauma. The danger then is that the media loses trust with accusations of bias and distortion, and everyone wants to promote their own truth, and the intergenerational anger will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, very much indeed. Can I just ask you, because one of the issues that came up at the um, conference that I mentioned before was to what extent the media should be an active or journalists, I should say, really not the you know, but the, the individuals who, who who operate the media, how much they should be activists in trying to address some of these issues of division and legacy. There seemed to be a sort of stark difference between some people who felt you no know, journalists just just inverted commas, you know, report the story and must remain independent, impartial out of it. Um, as if that's possible anyway, but I mean, certainly one, one can understand that there's a sort of professional sort of um, effort to that end, but obviously other people saying, but, you know, media is part of wider society. It actually creates a lot of the, uh, the environment in which we relate to each other. Um, and it's very important that it, it actually be used actively or its proponents be use it actively to to tackle division and these really important questions about how do we handle the past? I mean, is that something you've given a lot of thought to or have you got any sort of concrete reactions to that or? Yeah, <clears throat> I think, I suppose I would say that um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's the journalist's role to be a cheerleader for peace. Um, but I do think sometimes of the, 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 the medical term of, you know, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it, you know, journalists are great people for saying, you know, we, we have to tell it like it is. Um, I don't think we should su shut down dissident voices either. I think it's a really tricky balancing act, uh, you know, but at the same time, I think we do need to hear all voices, including uh, people who are angry. Um, 
you know, I mentioned about some of the reactions where you can get, we don't forget, we, you know, we have to apportion blame. I think if you shut down those voices, they are going to get angrier and they're going to lose faith in the, in the process. So it's a, it's a difficult balancing act for journalists, but I, I do think uh, that they have a responsibility to include all voices. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's really helpful. I think we're not, that's exactly one of the key issues we're going to sort of carry on with our, our other two contributors. So Amanda, um, you've got a particular interest in women in the media. So Annie, why don't you give us your, your sort of reflections about this topic? Great, thank you, Maggie. And uh, I just want to say how, how great the, the lineup this year is uh, for, for the Imagine Festival. And I'm delighted to see SEI uh, involved as well. Uh, we're doing a lot of great work here and um, I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Amanda Ferguson. I am a freelance journalist broadcaster um, from North Belfast. I write and talk and organize for a living. I'm a active NUJ member as well. I believe trade unionism is, trade unionism is very important within journalism. Uh, the question, how is the media in Northern Ireland addressing division and reflecting diversity? I think in some cases extremely well and in other cases not, not very well at all. Uh, you know, I am um, someone from North Belfast. I love this place. I love the people. I love being a journalist and working in the media, but I do view myself a little bit as a critic from the inside because I think that we can do better. Um, I think that Northern Ireland is a very patriarchal, very male society, and it can feel like it's a boys club that operates in, in almost every section of society. So we need to address that. We need to name it, uh, accept it and deal with it. And I think that we've made huge strides um, with regards to women's representation, but there is a lot of work uh, to be done. Um, I have always had an interest in my journalism career in how women are represented in the media. And, you know, I've never put sort of labels on myself. I entered journalism whenever I was 30, which is about nearly 11 years ago. Um, and I've always enjoyed the social media aspect um, as a tool to communicate with people. So it didn't take long for people to start labeling me as a feminist and a feminist writer. And I'd never really considered that label before, but I was, I guess I am, and I'm proud to be so. So I naturally am interested in issues that are impacting women. And that started from my student days, even at the, at the Belfast Telegraph, whenever I was on placement, that was um, evident. And I won the Newcomer of the Year Award and the Martin O'Hagan uh, Memorial Bursary in my first year as a journalist. And part of the portfolio of work that I'd submitted uh, to that was a feminist uh, piece. It was a piece I wrote with a feminist lens anyway about an ad campaign that was featuring women. So it was picked up by columnists and broadcasters and you know, it was the placement student up the corner that was sort of causing a bit of a fuss. So that was, that was good for me, but I did learn quickly the part of the reason why it was picked up um, was because of the, the controversial nature, nature, but also insincerely by some people because it was an excuse to reproduce images of scantily la uh, clad women. So that was a learning lesson for me. And then throughout my career, you know, there's been various points. I think um, one of them was the Department for Foreign Affairs has a First Fridays Women's Network and they had um, organized a, an International Women's Day event. Now that the network itself, itself draws women from, from across the piece. It's very positive and warm and a strong network of, of women in leadership roles from all backgrounds. And um, we were sort of called to, to you know, write down what our commitment was going to be in the year ahead, uh, you know, to support women and girls. So um, I sort of reaffirmed my commitment to centre women and girls in my work. And I've always sort of tried to maintain that, um, whether that was, you know, through the work I did for the Irish Times for six years or reaching an international audience with my ongoing work for Reuters news agency or my work for the Washington Post or on air or online or a speaking event such as this, just wherever, whenever I get the opportunity, really. And then SCI has provided me with the opportunity to do a fellowship, which is really going to be a deep dive into the representation of women in the media, um, you know, about the balance of power and how we um, change that to contribute to a more inclusive and open society. So all of the, the different strands of my work, they all overlap with each other. And earlier this year, myself and two colleagues, uh, Patricia McBride and Alison Morris, uh, two women I admired and learned from, you know, whenever I first came into journalism, we decided to set up uh, women in media Belfast because nothing like it existed and we felt that there was a need for it so it's all about confidence and capacity building and the launch of that had been delayed by COVID but then we just decided to go for it and, and move it online so it's about hearing from more women and not just in the media but on the media so at our first event which was just on International Women's Day past 
uh, we had it on Zoom and my panel event was where are the women marginalized voices in the media and I had five amazing women on my panel you know I could have filled it 10 times over but this was our first outing, so it was five women, and that was uh, Lillian Sinoy Barr, sorry, Sinoy Barr from the Northwest Migrants Forum. It was Stacey Graham, a young loyalist activist, uh, Rachel Powell, women's sector lobbyist, disabled woman, rural woman, um, Elspeth Fisher, who's a young uh, female filmmaker, also from the LGBT community, and then our former Alliance MLA, Anna Lowe, who knows a, a thing or two about being the first woman to do something. So it was lots of different perspectives, and it was about um, you know, how media relationships are handled, who gets to speak from various communities, you know, when it doesn't work well, when um, you know, it does work well. And some of what we heard was really hard to hear because you, know, you expect that your colleagues are, are doing the right by people on all occasions and to find out that isn't necessarily always the case was a little bit tough to, to listen to, but it was good learning and good practice and not really about listing the problems for the sake of it or a bashing exercise. You know, it was about addressing, addressing problems that exist and what works well and why. So that's a bit of an overview of who I am and, and what I think. Um, I just really just the, the, the main point would be we're half the people, so we should be half the voice and we're not there yet. And I say, yeah, because I believe we'll get there eventually. Thank you. I'm saying if you you have anything to go by, well, you're definitely, we'll definitely get there in terms of women's representation. Um, but I suppose one of the things that just struck me was that on social media, we just hear a lot about women, particularly uh, when they do raise their head above the parapet, you know, coming in for particular sort of abuse. Is that something that you have come across or you've heard about from other women who are trying to get more more involved and put across their their story in the in the media? Yes, definitely, Maggie. It is, it's a huge issue. Uh, the abuse on social media. You know, it used to be phone calls to newsrooms and strongly worded letters, but now people have in, instant access to you. And you know, it's it's a, it's like a coin. On one side, it's great because social media is a great leveler and it opens up channels of communication that didn't exist before. Um, and it means that you know people can talk to you and you can engage with them. And you know, I love it. I really enjoy it as a as a tool for the work that I do. But there is the downside to it, and obviously, there's a spectrum. Uh, of abuse that exists you know nobody is uh saying that there's a problem about robust challenge but it's whenever it's abus abusive or whenever it turns into serious threats or if it has to uh you know involve police or you know the social media platforms taking uh, this more seriously um i think that there's a lot there's lots of questions to be had on that um and i certainly know that it's a major issue but I don't want um I don't want it to to be something that puts other women in journalism off I think that one of the um not even just women in journalism or women in media or just any woman really who raises her voice uh, or anyone who raises their voice tends to to face this sort of online uh, abuse and it can be really like appalling uh, stuff obviously as I said before it's a spectrum but we have to um, find better ways uh, to, to address it. Definitely, that's you know un unquestionable. And I think that it was one of the issues that came up at the recent conference we had that it puts women off because you know not only um, are they being abused for having an opinion, but a lot of the abuse is gendered. A lot of it is misogynistic. A lot of it's sexual. You know, it can be rape threats, violence threats. You know, the the, the full sort of range. So it's definitely something that has to. to um, has to be addressed because it's not uh, something that's going anywhere anytime soon um, and we have to just sort of try and uh, build that confidence and build uh, that capacity um, because it, it can be sort of a wild west environment it can be a difficult place to be but I find that the the mute and the block buttons uh, come in handy so I can wield those whenever it's necessary but uh, yes yeah, certainly and I think that um it has to be not just the, the social media companies having a better response to it, but the education around it from a, from a very young age, because you know some of the people that get access to you uh, with their thoughts and their views, you know, the sort of people that you would cross the street to avoid. So, you know, why should they feel as if they can occupy your, your brain and, and your eyes? So, um, yes, it's certainly something that, that comes up routinely, but we don't uh, want it to be something that, um, you know, puts puts women off from, from becoming involved and, and making their voices heard. Exactly. Thank you very much indeed. 
So Ivy, you have the challenge of trying to make the voices heard of the ethnic, ethnic minority people from different ethnic minorities in Northern Ireland. Do you want to tell us a bit about the challenges that's created for you and how you've gone about trying to make the space for people to come forward and tell their stories? Thank you, Maggie. Um, it's really important for media to play its part um, in being inclusive of all communities in breaking down prejudice and discrimination by reflecting and normalizing the communities that live here. For all of us in Northern Ireland, it is our home and it is important that media demonstrates that our opinion matters, that our lives matter. It sends out a signal that we belong here and that we are part of the fabric of Northern Ireland. And especially at a time when hate crime has overtaken sectarian hate crime. And I'm not just talking about black and minority ethnic communities getting jobs in media, both on screen or off screen, but more importantly about diversifying content of expanding discussion to include minority voices. It is not as though people in Northern Ireland are not seeing diversity in the media when they're watching programs on national TV. There are many presenters from BME community presenting the national news. They're on comedy shows, game shows, panels, etc. And you can also see diversity reflected uh, when watching Netflix or Amazon Prime. So it isn't good enough that the media only include our voices when we're asked to comment on hate crime or show the occasional celebration of culture. So does the absence of diversity in our media contribute to our ethnic minorities remaining invisible? So the 2011 census showed an ethnic minority population of around 32,000 people. But we all knew at that time that, that those numbers were gonna grow. And so it has. In the 2021 census, we are expecting numbers to quadruple. And why do we think that's gonna happen? It's because the home office figures for EU nationals alone in Northern Ireland is about 81,000 as of December 31st, 2020. And that doesn't take into account the people from other countries that have made uh, their home here in Northern Ireland. Therefore, the question of the relationship between media and diverse communities is becoming increasingly relevant and increasingly important. And thanks to the rise of social media and new accessible platforms, we have seen minority voices being amplified. And we can see how articulate, intelligent and passionate people are and it makes me wonder why we can't have those voices in mainstream dialogues. There are voices from first generation, second generation, now third generation immigrants, but the voices in mainstream media are missing or very minimal. Now for young people growing up in Britain, there are a number of role models that can, they can look up to on screen and off screen, but the absence of that here will not encourage young people to think of it as a viable career option. I don't know if much is being done to encourage more young people from BME communities interested in media, whether there are young people being encouraged to participate in work experience programs or look at careers uh, in the media. If media in the UK have been effective in ensuring uh, representation of the BME communities that is in mainland Britain, I hope we can find a way of representing a much smaller percentage of our BME communities here. Just as there is a desire to include opinions from unionist and nationalist communities, the inclusion of minority voices must be actively sought. And I know you, you did that wonderfully, Amanda, at your Women in Media conference, which you just mentioned by inviting Lillian Sinoy Barr to speak. I was also delighted when yesterday I was contacted by our, our TV channel here, who's doing a story on people's experiences during COVID and wanted to include a voice from our community. Ordinary stories in these extraordinary times affecting all people in different ways and demonstrating that we're all in it together. I think the media can only improve representation by engaging with young people as well as BME community leaders to get to know BME communities, to understand their viewpoints, their issues, and to have that reflected so that five years from now or 10 years from now, we're not having the same uh, conversation. I appreciate it's a tad challenging time for those in the media, but we must find a way of including and making space for those who have for a very long time felt they are the other in society here. 
the launch of digital magazines has given space to those who want to tell their stories. And the increase of, increasing use of social media platforms has given a voice to those who have remained voiceless so far. And now is a good place to start. I can only hope that mainstream media will step up and take measurable steps to amplify the voices of the ME community here in Northern Ireland. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed, Ivy. Um, do, you, do you feel that you've raised these issues, you and, and others have raised these issues before and they just haven't been listened to? Or do you think, have you got any sense of why those voices aren't being represented currently in the media, the mainstream media at least? I, I think that Denzel had briefly touched upon it when he said, you know, that there are sources that media people go to, and those are the sources that they keep going back to. And, and to include new voices, I think, is a challenge. So that could be one, one issue. And I think that perhaps there is a slow um, change to that. And I hope that seeing all the voices on social media now will encourage journalists to approach us and they'll know where to come. So there's really no excuse anymore if they really want to get in touch as they do when uh, there is a hate crime and they want to comment on that, they know where to find us. So why is it that on any other opinion uh, that is sought, we are not found? And I was going to ask Denzel or Amanda if they want to come back on, uh, you know, in a sense, particularly Denzel, because you've now heard the other the other two represent the contributors, sort of anything that sort of you'd like to pick up there in, in what they've said that, you know, reinforces what you wanted to get across or that contradicts it that you want to challenge, you know? Certainly not challenge. I, I, I'm interested to hear um, when I refer to, if we're speaking about legacy, that all voices should be heard. Um, I think that applies right across the board. Um, I think the tendency when we're covering um, subject of legacy, I, I, I refer to the fact that, um, you know, we, the media tends to take the establishment line. Um, the media undoubtedly is run by, by historically by men, by white men. Um, it, it's, it's comfortable. They just keep going back to the same sources. I did refer to the fact that I think um, there are issues in society and the media is part of society. Um, I don't feel that our media reflects that society well enough. I don't think we've moved forward enough. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, when Amanda, I was pleased to hear her describe herself as a critic from the inside. I think we need a lot more critics from the inside. I think it's, you know, there, there isn't enough regulation. Uh, um, trust me, I'm, I'm in favor of a free press and regulation scares me in a sense, but we shouldn't be afraid of it because we should, we should challenge ourselves. We should challenge ourselves. And the, the big question is if we want to continue to play a role because there are many challenges facing the media um, the mainstream media as regards resources, social media, you know, the reputation that we have now because of fake news, et cetera, et cetera. So if we want to be strong, we have to embrace change and we have to better reflect society. And I don't think we do. Amanda, come in. Yes, no, I was just going to say uh, thank you, Denzel, um, as a fr and, and Ivy as well. Uh, as a freelance journalist, I think that I am in a position, along with other freelancers, to have a bit more freedom about what I can say. And even though I have the that kind of power, I also am the most vulnerable because I'm freelance. So, you know, people don't have to give you a reason about why they don't want you to work for them again. And that's that's fair enough. But I think at the start of my career, um, you know, I, I remember an editor once said to me, it was a kind of a, you know, don't rock the boats. Uh, from the inside, uh, the, the phrase was don't shit in your own doorstep, uh, which was the, the advice that I was given. Uh, but the, the reason I'm a critic from the inside is because I want it to be better. I want it to be a better experience. I can see, uh, you know, through my practice and, uh, you know, what I'm doing, where I've done it well. And I want um, that. I think it's a better experience for everybody involved whenever it happens that way. And I think one of the problems about here is that the North is the least diverse region of the UK and Ireland out of everywhere. You know, it's a very white place and I know that that's changing. Um, but, you know, and I know that there have been lots of com communities that have made their home here for, for many decades, but it does still feel very white. And I think that that is because we're a little bit obsessed with ourselves. We're a little bit obsessed with the sort of orange green stuff and everything that Ivy has, has highlighted are issues that have come up 
um, you know, from, from people that I've spoken to before that, you know, they, they don't want to just be interviewed because they're from minority background, you know, over hate crime or over a cultural issue. Nobody ever asks about the economy or the constitution or anything like that. And it's very much, um, there's still maybe perhaps a little bit of treating people like an addition to society rather than part of society. So that's something that we definitely have to challenge. And, and one of the reasons that we put uh, together Women in, in Media Belfast was because we are three women who are routinely asked for our opinions on things. And you know, I'll, I'll turn down stuff if it's not relevant to me, but even something during the COVID pandemic, whenever the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, uh, you know, were about, uh, that was like a global moment. That was something, you know, that everybody was going to be involved with. And I had producers coming to me to ask, and I was like, you know, I, I could talk about this, but could you please go and ask a black woman or a black man? Because, you know, that's I, I don't have that experience. I can understand discrimination on a variety of levels, but that's not one of the, the levels that I personally would understand. So I think that it's about trying to get as many different types of uh, voices and as many different women air ready so that they're right at the top of the list for producers to to contact them and I think there's there's an element of laziness around it um and some of it, it some of it I don't think is intentional uh, but it's certainly you know uh, you know it's something that has to be addressed and and particularly there could be more of a focus uh, around the journalism training within the colleges as well and we hope to to work with them to try and and bring some of these issues because there's nothing wrong with being critical, you know, I'm critical of, uh, of everything I do. I'll watch this back after it goes out to see how I performed. I'll read back everything that I send to an editor. I'll listen back or watch myself back, even though it can be uncomfortable because I want to get better. Uh, so I just want everybody to want to get better. Ivy, what, I mean, any sort of practical things that you would suggest? I mean, given that this topic is about, um, you know, role of media in dealing expanding diversity and dealing with division any specific things that you think you know we should be doing as we go ahead i mean what should be our agenda of change what sort of things should we be push, pushing for i think that uh, you know if the media is really interested they could get in touch we have a very effective racial equality subgroup with quite a number of leaders from the ethnic minority community who are part of that so through that, you, they could get their connections and have sort of the oven ready people uh, to, to put forward their views or be, be part of the conversations or to be part of panels. So that is there. And there are people who are, uh, who've been here for generations, you know, first generations people who have been part of the troubles, who have experiences through the troubles, who could co comment on that. And then there's the second generation who've been to school here and been to universities here and who would have a view on very many things, just like anybody else who's grown up, here, who's born here and grown up here. But I think it's very, very important to get to know those people and to get to know those communities and have them uh, ready to speak if, if there are issues that need to be commented on. Yeah, but it, this key thing that you're all saying is it needs the people who are already engaged in the media to recognize that this is part of their their role to reach beyond the in a sense the comfort zone and the same people that they're used to talking to or people you know in a sense very much like themselves um i thought your point amanda about the sort of getting to training the training of journalists and so on, trying to get them to see what an important role, speaking as someone outside of media completely, just feel it's such an important role can be performed by the media in, you know, bringing disparate viewpoints together, encouraging debate, encouraging people to understand, you know, how it might have been, how, you know, some of the points that Denzel was making, how, how the troubles might have been experienced differently by different people. And that doesn't mean to say that they're wrong and you're right or vice versa, but just it, it's a different experience and, and the media has such an important role in, in bringing that forward and whether it's on grounds of gender or ethnicity or you know, the orange and green thing about the, the, the legacy of the past. So it's really just any, any more thoughts that we could be sort of pushing uh, as, you know, in our separate ways or 
Yeah, I, I think that we need to, I think we waste a lot of time getting pre uh, people to prove that there's a problem rather than accepting it and moving on from there. So, you know, women are still having to explain that misogyny is a thing or that racism is a thing in Ireland when it should just be granted that, that they are actual things, you know, they're, they're, they're people's experiences and there's a lot of time wasted on that. And I think that we have to change the type of conversation that we're having. You know, I understand, uh, you know, particularly for the broadcasters, the need to have that sort of, uh, you know how it's described as balance or to make sure it's around a conversation but there's a problem in that um you know I, I think of COVID as an example a minority um extreme view maybe someone who's an anti-vaxxer is given a 50 50 weighting with someone who's a public health expert or a scientist who knows what they're talking about so it seems you know even whenever it comes down to um how the women's reproductive um rights conversation takes place you know that the sometimes those extreme views are are given prominence that they don't actually deserve and i'm not saying that you don't include that conversation but you know what are we going to learn from you know having a row about you know you know even today when we're, we're we're talking about the women's reproductive rights stuff we know what the different views are on it we're, we're we're talking it needs to be more rounded more um thoughtful conversations i think rather than just you know i say i think this and this person doesn't agree with what i think it's you know there's not much value in that to me no i agree that that sort of 50 50 impartiality thing can be extremely misleading in fact about the nature of the debate and bringing us forward and Denzel just I don't know if this is correct but I remember I was talking to Stephen and he was saying that when you were on the impartial reporter one of the the changes that you brought about because it would be largely would have been seen in the past as very much you know speaking bought by the unionist community even things like covering GAA matches it just seems to me you know as someone now visiting only Northern Ireland from London and still seeing you know the news refracted through the Irish news and the newsletter and thinking well the other community doesn't you know you compare them and sometimes they don't cover the same stories or so I just wondered again that was a very practical thing that you did um other things like that that we could be doing in order to ensure that different voices and different experiences are, are heard by by everyone <laughs> I think one of the major issues that we face um, at the moment is how the media is funded. Um, I think if you look at, I mean, in the South, for example, they have a, they've just launched a, a Future of the Media Commission. Um, you know, the model of um, having newspapers um, which have to make money uh, to fund journalism, um, I think it's broken. I mean, it was astounded that to hear that, um, you know, in Australia, the media, it's something like 70% um, of Australia's newspapers are owned by Murdoch. Mm -hmm. um, in Britain, you know, most of the dailies are owned by uh, sort of mm. very wealthy people. Um, we do have a little bit of public uh, funded journalism in the BBC, but I think there are serious questions about that as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think if we had some sort of form of public funding, um, which doesn't touch the day-to-day -day in the sense of being too robustly uh, interfering with day-to-day -day press freedom. But if there was public funding, which would allow things like investigative journalism and other stories, because what we tend to get at the moment is if newspapers and uh, commercial stations are chasing a never dwindling pot of money as regards, you know, people aren't buying as many newspapers, people aren't advertising as much, there, there isn't as much money. So they just go after the tried and trusted which they know will sell newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think if we actually expand that out and have a properly funded, publicly funded journalism uh, part, then I think we could do much more in all sorts of diverse areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very true. So maybe we're sort of coming to the end of our sort of allotted time. So maybe you just ask each of you if there's anything particular that you think you either haven't had a chance to say or that you you know just feel that's the... Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Ivy. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so for me, what I would like to see is young people um, being welcomed into work placements or being trained so that, you know, the future generations, there will be hope that they, we will have uh, people from ethnic minority communities on screen and off screen and also more engagement with community leaders so that we will have voices that will join the discussions that are ongoing at the minute whether it's on women's reproductive rights, as Amanda said, or whether it's on the protocol, 
but I'm sure that you know there will be people within our communities that can contribute to those conversations and we need to see the voices being reflected because otherwise we will remain as invisible as we are today. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thank you. And Denzel, any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, I've been involved in a number of discussions recently about the future of this island, and we talk about a new, a new Ireland or a shared island or whatever. I think one of the points that I continuously make is we actually already have a new, a new Ireland. Um, you know, we have a, a brighter, younger uh, community now. We do have um, all sorts of new communities. Um, it's already a new place, but I don't think the media reflects that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just would like to see us you know, broaden our horizons a little bit more to better reflect society. Mm -hmm. Amanda? Um, yeah, just listen to what my, my colleagues are saying there. I think sometimes uh, Northern Ireland can fall a little bit between the two jurisdictions. So, you know, the, the Republic of Ireland will have a focus on the future of the media. You know, Britain will have a, its own focus. And sometimes, uh, you know, the North is somewhere sort of in, in between uh, the two. And I, I actually think that the, the quality of journalism in, in Northern Ireland is probably the best across these islands because we've had to deal with such... Um, Sort of an extreme set of circumstances and it's very complex you know i sometimes feel like a like a primary school teacher i think you know explaining the sort of uh, complexities of, of this wonderful place that we live in to, to to different audiences but i think that we have to allow um a new generation to to come forward i'm not saying that there isn't value in veterans and that there isn't value in people who have seen it all and and been through it all but i, I think that there needs to be a, a move away from that a little bit to allow the sort of more international perspective of younger people uh, to come through you know not to say that younger people aren't interested in the the bread and butter the the green and orange or the constitution or any of that sort of stuff but i just think we need to sort of broaden it out a little bit and i think that for models uh, of journalism and, and and funding you know the 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 days of you know i remember my my mum you know behind the big copy of the broadsheet newspaper you know that's not going to last forever and i think we have to be more creative about the output of of journalism and bring an extra value to everything we do you know journalists are having to learn new skills all the time i don't think that uh, the you know reporting um you know is is all that um, it's going to be. I think you need to bring the extra value with the analysis side of stuff because digital has just changed the entire landscape. Everything's at your fingertips instantly and constantly. Um, and I just think that the, there's a lot of work to do, but I think it's exciting as well as, as much as it's um, a very challenging time for the media industry. Um, I think that it's a really exciting time as well. And I think we just have to adapt to, to, to all those changes. Well, listen, can I thank you, the three of you, very warmly indeed. That was a marvellous, you know, introduction, if, in fact, for, certainly for me to think more about so many different issues. But thank you all very, very much indeed for participating in this. And we just, on, on goes the struggle, I suppose. Mm -hmm.